On one of my trips to Eretz Yisrael, on the 1 a.m. from JFK, I was seated next to whom I thought were a non-Jewish couple. In the middle of the night, I was approached by somebody who asked me to join them for a minion to Davin Shachros at the back of the plane. And my Rebbe told us that we shouldn't do that. It wakes people up. It's not a Kiddush Hashem. It's not proper to make a lot of noise on the plane in the middle of the night. Rather, we should daven alone at our seats. But since I was awakened and realized it was time for Shachris, I prepared to daven Shachris, quietly, alone at my seat. A few minutes after I put on my talus and tefillin, I noticed the couple next to me were putting on their talus and tefillin, both of them. And I noticed all around me, there was a large group of people that were there together traveling to Eretz Yisrael on some fact-finding mission. It was a group of Reformed Jews. And the rabbi led them in Shachris, where they were all seated in one section of the plane. The rabbi being a female, wearing a talus and tefillin, and a yamalka, And they davened whatever their Shachris was. At the end, my neighbor turned to me and said to me, are you angry at us? I said, why would I be angry at you? He said, because you don't believe in what we're doing. You don't believe in a female rabbi. And I said to him, I'm not angry at you. And I said, Hashem is not angry at you. God is not angry at you. You're going to get a great reward for these prayers. You're not expected to be any better than your rabbi. You can't know more than what your rabbi teaches you. And she can't know more than what she studied in seminary. So she too is a very good, devoted person who's going to get a fine reward. She went to a seminary that didn't tell her the full truth about Judaism, that's all. But you're all good people. I'm not angry at anybody. So he said to me, could you prove to me that we're making a mistake, that my rabbi wasn't taught the truth? So I told him to give me his sitter. And I showed him Kiddush Levana, the tefillah that we say once a month when the new moon comes. And I showed him that we jump three times, as it says, and we say, Hareini Reiket Kenegdech. I am jumping towards you. But I can't touch you. I can't reach the moon. No matter how, how, how high I jump, I'm so far from the moon. And we ask Hashem, Kach lo yuchlu kol oivai So too my enemies should not be able to reach me. The same way I jump, but I cannot reach you. That's how distant Hashem should keep the enemies from reaching me. Now look, my Siddur has this passage, and yours does not. Now we have a rule, one of our laws in our Book of Laws, that we cannot change anything that previous rabbis put into our prayer book or into the laws, unless we are as great in knowledge and in number as those rabbis were. And we know that we are not nearly as great in knowledge as the Ansh Knesset HaKadoyal, the people who put most of our prayers together. So no matter what questions we have about the prayers, we wouldn't change the book. And so we have this for thousands of years in our prayers. Your book is missing this passage. Do you know why? He said, no, he didn't know why. So I'll tell you why. Because in 1969, the astronaut Neil Armstrong was the first American astronaut to land on the moon. And he brought back rocks. He brought back with him. So your rabbi said, hey, we touched the moon. And it says here, I jump in front of you and I cannot touch you. But we did touch, erase. Now let me ask you, I said to this man and his wife, did Neil Armstrong touch the moon? If he would have taken off his grubby glove that was full of oxygen from Earth, he was wearing a tank on his back, if he would have taken off that glove and tried to touch the moon with his hand, would his hand have existed in the atmosphere of the moon? And they said, no. Right. So he never touched the moon. This thick glove of his uniform touched the moon. And still, it's missing from your book. Now, how could you know this? How could you understand this? How could your rabbi know this? She just got this book when she was studying at seminary. I said, so you're great people, you're wonderful. Now, what we try to do at Ura is to enlighten people, to know what the Torah really is and what the real truth is. And it starts from young and goes to all ages. We thank God have the ability to touch all types of people. 
the oldest group in camp is called Discover You. And I've been close to them for the years that I've been in Ura. And let me tell you something. They call it Discover You. I feel it's Discover Me. Because as we share with these people who are searching for the truth, we discover so much more about ourselves. We grow so much more. So it's really invigorating, I'd say exhilarating, to be a part of Ura and to work with these children and adults who are looking to find the truth and purpose in life. I'd venture to say that the same way HaKadosh Baruch Hu rewards those who are physically there on the spot and who are offering of themselves to the members of Ura, the fact that we are growing, I'd venture to say that Hashem would reward those who have supported Ura and given us the wherewithal to be able to do this work, the same way Zivulan and Yisachar work, that those who work and support the Kolel people, people who are learning Torah, get the reward for all of that Torah study. I would imagine that those who have supported Ura, who have given generously and helped us do our work, are also given something within themselves that Hashem allows them and helps them to discover themselves. And just a few examples. Ben, from Bethesda, Maryland, five years ago, close to his bar mitzvah age, became interested in finding out more about authentic Yiddishkeit, authentic Judaism. He has a Torah mate, thanks to Ura. And that Torah mate has brought him to a level where he not only upholds the Torah, he knows how to learn the Torah. And this coming year, after graduating high school, he's planning to go to a yeshiva in Beit Shemesh. Aaron, who had been at Ura and learned a certain amount of halacha of law at Ura, found out that on Mitzray Shabbos, at the end of Shabbos, we make Havdalah. We say that special bracha that separates Shabbos and the weekdays. And we don't eat until we make Havdalah. And he didn't realize that when he goes home, if his parents don't allow him to make Havdalah, of course he really could eat. He's doing his very best. He didn't know that. So one week, when his parents did not like the idea of his making Havdalah and didn't allow him to do it, he waited until Sunday morning when he could make Havdalah to eat. He didn't eat from Mitzvah Shabbos till Sunday morning. Although he could have eaten, it just so shows the sincerity that Aaron had in his Yiddishkeit, in his Judaism, that he picked up at Ura. Tzvi was davening at, at Tzvi Kaplan's yeshiva in Yerushalayim, Yomim Neroim time, when everybody has to have a designated seat. He saw someone davening in front of him with tremendous feeling, tremendous passion. He was moved. And he leaned over, looked at that bocher, and he thought to himself, I know him. I recognize this fellow. So he went outside to the lobby to look at the sign at the chart that had the names of all those people seated in the base Hakonesis, in the base Medrash that day for Dominic. And sure enough, he recognized the name. It was a boy who had come to Ura to learn about Yiddishkeit. And now he was sitting in our three Kaplan's yeshiva, davening in a way that we all wish we would daven in that way, with that kind of a passion. He actually understood the Yeda called Paul Kiato Pialtoi, the prayer, the tefillah, that every creation of Hashem should know that Hashem created him. That's the way he was davening. And we could all grow from him. We could discover ourselves because this Bachar, Tzvi, discovered himself at Ura. Rabelsky visited Ura and a young boy approached him, not only shook his hand and said, Shalom Aleichem, he begged Rav Belsky for a blessing for a bracha. What kind of a bracha do you want? Rav Belsky asked him. Please give me a bracha that I should be able to go to yeshiva next year. All this is so inspiring. Those of us who Baruch Hashem have the ability to learn Torah would be inspired by these precious, pure neshamas to spend more time, more quality time learning Torah. It's something tremendous. Ura benefits those who are at this point ignorant, but it really benefits the very learned as well. People of all ages and all levels could be inspired by what goes on in Ura. One Ura family that even when they were not observant, wanted to keep kosher, 
were shaken up when one day one of their children wanted to eat non-kosher food at a certain party. And they said, no, no, we eat kosher. And they said, but the rabbi's daughter is eating it because they were part of a reformed temple. And the rabbi's daughter was eating the non-kosher meat. And so they searched for something better for their children, to inspire their children. And they heard about Ura. Well, they have one son today studying in Eretz Yisrael, one child in a yeshiva in Long Island, and there are 14 other children whose families were inspired by this couple to send their children to yeshiva as well. The roots all came from Ura. And so, whether we can touch the moon or we cannot touch the moon, but Ura can touch the Jewish neshama and can bring the reality of true Torah life to whomever it has the zechus to touch. And hopefully, such activity, belonging, and helping such an organization as Ura will hasten the day of the Kapsenu Yachad, when Hashem will gather us all together, Me'araba Kan Aretz, from the four corners of the earth, La'aretzenu, back to our true home, Yerushalayim Ir HaKodesh.